Okay, Lost Bone Casters, I've got a big project to share with you. I've been busy making automotive parts on and off for the last few years and made a few intake manifold parts and carb adapters and lids and things like that, but this time I decided to make the whole intake manifold. So what you're looking at is um, it's an independent runner or an individual runner intake manifold um, for a pair of inline Autolite uh, carburetors. They're kind of a rare exotic carburetor from back around 1970 and they were developed for the Trans Am racing program and one of the engines that campaigned in that program were Boss 302s and so this is set up to uh, mount to a Boss 302 engine and I was just going to show you a little bit about the intake manifold, tell you a little bit about the pour and uh, what it took to make it. It's my by far my largest, most complicated lost foam pattern and pour uh, to date. It's about 22 inches long, about uh, 11 inches wide, uh, four and a half inches tall, and I expect that uh, the raw casting will probably weigh uh, in the mid 20s, mid to high 20s, 25, 26 pounds, maybe as much as 30. And with the feed system and uh, a generous pouring cup there could be another 10 pounds on top of that so uh, this is going to be a, at least a 35 pound uh, pour and to do that I needed to make some special handling equipment because um, I'll have to use my uh, A60 crucible because that's the next biggest crucible that I have above A20 and by the time I put the shank and the metal and everything else it's probably going to be about uh, 120 130 pounds to handle and uh, there was a time when I might have thought about slinging that around, but uh, I'm making myself a piece of lifting equipment to do that for. But um, looking at the intake manifold, um, we've got eight individual runners, as I mentioned, uh, a flange uh, for each barrel of the carburetor. Um, there's an inline four barrel carburetor that mounts uh, on each side here. This uh, thing in the center is a tuning plenum that allows some degree of communication um, between the ports. and. Uh, Besides the 8.2 inch deck uh, um, that engine that it's intended to mount to um, on that, it's got a uh, provisions for a plenum, a vacuum plenum underneath. That's what this little shelf uh, is for there. And maybe just to get a better look at uh, kind of the intake proportions, this is the vacuum port that access that lower intake plenum. And then this is the cap. Um, for the tuning plenum that you see here, that'll be cast as a separate piece on that and we'll, we'll bolt to it. And uh, consistent with uh, the theme of the 1970s era TA, Trans Am Racing Intakes, I put these water snouts on it because that was a feature that most all of the racing intakes, at least the Boss 302 ones of the day, uh, had on that. So uh, it should be quite the pour. I'll come back and show you um, what I've got in mind uh, to gate it and pour it. That'll be a whole separate discussion on that. But it'll be poured vertically, um, straight up and down, or with a little bit of incline to it, like this. And I'll put the gating on it and come back to you. Maybe just a little bit, too, about how the pattern was made. I, I pieced a lot of it together, but a lot of people ask me um, how I make these patterns. and. Uh, um, it's all with pretty simple woodworking tools, and uh, I have to build some crude texturing in order to, you know, get it accurately assembled. But um, the major elements um, of this are the the flanges, which there's two of, and they're identical on that. The runners, which there's uh, two, four, five, six pieces in each runner. I'll show you how those were made, and then the carb flanges. And there's a lot of little bosses and things like that, but I've got um, a set of tenon cutters that, that cut plugs, just perfect plugs out of foam. So when I, whenever I need um, a boss, I just you know cut a whole bunch of plugs and then slice them up to whatever thickness that I need on that. And maybe uh, just a little bit about the major parts of how um, this was made. <coughs> First, the runners. So. Um, now here's an example of one of the building block pieces of the runner, and here's, uh, here's how they were made. Um, the first thing that happened there was is I made a, a right and a left jig um, for my pin router. And I don't know if you can see these or not, but uh, 
there's a little, this is the wall thickness, this little groove here. Um, and this is this medium density uh, fiberboard. And I cut that out and uh, shaped it up on the spindle sander and glued the pieces together. But um, I've got a pin router, and a pin router is uh, just an overarm router that holds, uh, you know, a, a router bit in the air, and it, it can actuate up and down, but this pin, this guide pin, is directly aligned below um, the cutting bit. And by changing the diameter of the cutting bit and or the diameter of the pin, you can trace out patterns. So in, in this case, uh, there's a right and a left side because it makes this side and this side um, of the runner. Here's the pattern for it. So it would be guided on this pin with uh, this bit cutting here with a one inch pin down below guiding it and then the same thing on this side. And then in the center, I'd just knock the center out with this uh, bottom cutting bit. And then finally, when I took it off the fixture, I'd just use uh, this rounding over bit then uh, to round over the edges. And then you end up with a right half and a left half and you glue them together and then you get a runner. You know, like this, at least the straight section of it with the elbow in it. And then there's the curvature of it and similarly, um, to get the curves, um, I just took and I took a piece of foam, I used the same bits, and I used that overarm bit and I just set it off center and when that bit came down and, and plunged, uh, in, in this corner. Um, I did that diameter and spun this disc around like this and it cut that circular shape and I did the same thing on the ID then here and then used that same bottom cutter to knock out what was in between them. And when you spun it all around I ended up with a disc um, that was like this and then this one, uh, this disc is, is got the cross section that's the same height as the runner. So when you cut um, a pair of those, and uh, I would just take um, a piece of sheet metal and uh, hold that at the angle, trace out with a template, um, with a, just a marker and a template, the angle that I wanted, hold a straight edge on this, and then just use that straight edge to guide the cut on the hot wire. And you get a pair of uh, pieces like so, two little segments like so, and you can hot glue them together and end up with a small turning segment like this, and then you can glue it onto the other one. This one has actually got the cross section of the vertical um, part of the runner, and this one was cut horizontal, so it comes out um, of, of the flange, it turns horizontal um, at that, and then it turns at another 20-25 degrees, and you put the, uh, the straight section on the end of it and you've got a runner. And you can tune these up a little bit just by uh, you know, taking a piece of uh, pressure sensitive uh, adhesive abrasive paper, put it on a flat surface and then just lap the surfaces so they're nice and flat. And if you need to tune it a little bit, you can just put a little pressure on one side and you can tune the angles in pretty closely like that and fit them up. So, um, and so you do that eight times, and um, when I was setting them up, I just used packing tape to, to um, stick them together so they weren't stuck together uh, permanently to fit them up. But after I got them fit up the way I wanted to, um, I just stuck them together with hot glue, and uh, it was quick. And uh, I went to town on that, and I had eight runners, so I had that section across the center. In the future, what I'd like to do for that center section, I've got a CNC router sitting out. You can't see outside the... Uh, um, the uh, um, camera here, but I'd like to take these runners and part them this way and do that whole center section with in just a single uh, piece on the bottom and a single piece on the top, and that would save a bunch of time and allow me to do some uh, uh, more interesting things with the shape and transition uh, of the runner. So anyway, that gets me the runner. Um, there's a couple more pieces that uh, are, are key to that. One of them is just the carb flange. I made a, a separate uh, um, a fixture to do that. I'll show you in a second. But uh, you can see that it transitions from a rectangular opening to a circular opening. And what I did was is I cut the, uh, 
I made a fixture to cut the rectangular opening on the bottom and a circular opening on top. And uh, the circular opening was done with a, with a ball nose cutter, so the transition was partly done, and I just did the rest by hand with a little coarse sandpaper. Uh, one thing with foam is you can, you can shape that in in a few seconds if you're careful um, on, in how you do it. But for these uh, flange parts, um, I just made this simple fixture here, which had the shape of the flange um, on the bottom and the shape of the runner. And by making multiple cuts and positioning it um, on, on the peg there, I could fashion these, uh, these flanges, which is it's the same for each one of the eight. Um, it's just a matter of on, on this one it faces this direction and on this one it faces that direction. So that uh, completes the connection of the carburetor. And then the very first building block um, of the uh, uh, intake manifold were the flanges that bolt to the head. And all this is is the shape of that uh, uh, intake flange. And that there is the, uh, actually it's the cross section of the runner. So you can kind of see uh, when I put that down, the pin uh, is guided um, on those runner sections down here. And what it allows me to do is I get a profile, um, the shape of the, the intake flange, but it's also got a raised section a quarter of an inch with a radius on it that blends in um, to, the, to the runners on there. And, and this allows me to, um, gives me something that makes it naturally uh, um, uh, aligning on that. You can get things lined up properly um, easily with it and you don't have to lay um, fill it. Although um, you can see that I have lay, I laid a whole bunch of uh, wax fillet on this because of all the pieces that I've glued together. Um, I dip these things in a refractory coating uh, before they're poured and if you don't have all the uh, seams and cracks sealed that refractory coating will penetrate any crack that's in there and uh, create a flaw in your casting. So you do have to seal everything up pretty good. But uh, anyway, that's just kind of a, a quick primer on uh, the intake manifold and uh, how it was made. Um, it's going to be an exciting pour for me because, like I said, one, I've got a ton of time invested in that uh, pattern. And uh, I'm doing a lot of things that are first for me. It's a big pour. I'm going to be using some equipment um, that I haven't used before. Um, it's going to be... Uh, you know, I'm going to have to use lifting equipment uh, to do it, and uh, it's a lot of foam to evaporate and a lot of aluminum for, you know, 30, 40 pounds of molten metal. Um, it's not child's play, but uh, I'll be back with you as we progress along here through the project, and I'll show you um, how it all comes together, and hopefully uh, it will. And also, for those watching, I'll paste, uh, there's a thread, um, a detailed thread with lots of pictures um, on the intake, um, all the pieces of it and how it was made at thehomefoundry.org. Um, be sure to join up there and uh, I'll put the direct link to this uh, intake manifold build um, in, in the uh, um, uh, uh, comments section of this video. And uh, go have a look at it. And uh, hopefully when it comes time to pour, I'll have good news to report. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone, back with you again. I said I'd uh, rejoin you after I got the uh, pattern gated, and that's at the point we're at right now. Uh, you can see all the white expanded polystyrene um, on the pattern is the gating system. It's a very low density foam. It's less than a pound per cubic foot, somewhere between probably eight tenths uh, of a pound per cubic foot and a pound per cubic foot. Um, you can see that I've got this main trunk line here. Uh, it's a half inch wide and about uh, an inch to an inch and a quarter tall. Uh, main trunk line comes right down uh, Broadway here. Uh, let's turn this around maybe so you can see that. What it looks like. So here's the main feed on that. And uh, here's the uh, pattern. So you can see there's a, there's a one inch boss inside this little vacuum plenum for every cylinder. So there's eight of those. So I took advantage of that... Uh, that one inch boss, is, which is pretty massive, that's a good location to feed from. So I stepped down, put another little boss on that, and connected it uh, to the uh, main trunk line. And then off that same main trunk line, I also put these little legs out to the, uh, the ears on the uh, carburetor uh, flanges on that. So that uh, kind of minimizes the distance that, uh, the maximum distance that any uh, metal has to travel on that, but really the, uh, 
The main feed system for this pattern is really on the back side here. So I'll just see if I can get it in view for you. So uh, here is where the main sprue um, will be. Um, I don't put the sprues on them because it makes them awkward to handle and it makes them fragile out here. I, I put a little, put a little block of wood on because that's something I can put a screw in. And same thing down on this other end. You can see down here. You probably notice this hunk of wood and these two extensions here. That's only something for me to hold on to and manipulate it with when I'm dipping it because they get heavy. And also when you go to submerge the pattern, um, they're really quite buoyant and there's a lot of force that it takes to completely submerge the, the pattern. So I'll only submerge it uh, vertically halfway from each side. But each of those um, things on the end gives me something substantial um, to handle the pattern with when I'm, when I'm dipping it on that. But these uh, runners, they're about an inch and a quarter um, by a half inch wide up here and they taper as they get down uh, the, uh, the pattern and they attach um, at the most massive part of the intake itself because these flanges are a half inch thick and everything else on the intake is a quarter inch uh, wall thickness. So it's a half inch here and a half inch here on the, on the bottom side. So that gives a nice massive area to really feed the entire part um, with a runner like this on each side. And they're kind of centralized, you know, it's maybe three inches or so from the runner. So I ought to be able to really get a pretty good distribution of, of hot metal there. And I put this web here um, across the top. It'll fan out and feed this. But this is mostly just for strength, just to support the, uh, the sprue so I can handle it. But um, And finally, these little pink uh, um, uh, bosses on here, they're just feet for, for drying. When I dip it, I'll hang it for a while in different uh, orientations to get the most of, of the uh, slurry off of it. But then when um, the majority of the slurry is dripped off, I'll just set it on a piece of cardboard like this on those feet and then um, let it dry the rest of the way. And I don't know, I'll, maybe I'll cut the feet off before I cast it. They don't really make much difference um, in all of that. But uh, outside of that, um, it's pretty much done and ready to be dipped. Um, I got a couple little details. I put a little emblem on here and then I'll have a part number. I had to uh, order um, some foundry letters because I didn't have the right font that I wanted. So when I get those, um, I'll put the part number on it and then it'll be ready to be dipped. And I'll probably rejoin you again um, when I go to dip it. Um, there's the, not a lot of exciting that goes on when I, I dip it, but maybe just to show you the, the beauty of dipping the pattern, it's, it's fast. It's really fast as far as it takes like no labor to dip a pattern like this in, in a vat of slurry. And then of course you just, you know, set it to dry and go about your business. So, uh, but anyway, so that's the pattern. Um, you've got a pretty good look at it. Um, hopefully we'll have a success story when it comes time to casting. I've got um, quite a bit of work to do to get my casting apparatus ready to uh, make this big cast, but uh, I might do that in a second part video. Um, I'll, all this to keep the video length at a kind of a manageable uh, length so it doesn't put people to sleep. But uh, I'll rejoin you again shortly. Stay tuned. Hello, everybody. I'm back with you. Um, after dip coating the uh, intake manifold that's dried overnight and it's not completely dry yet but it's it's dry enough that on um, most of the external features where we can handle it and take a look at it <clears throat> um, I'm going to use this little segment of the video both uh, in the uh, video series for making this intake manifold and this uh, short series on um, dip coating lost foam patterns so you might see it twice if you follow me and watch my videos but um, by and large, things turned out, um, they're going to be just fine. Um, I'd say it's about 90% dry uh, right now. A couple of things that I didn't mention um, in the dip coating uh, video is, is that it was kind of hard to manipulate the pattern after I went on and on about how great dip coating was. Between that and trying to video it and stand, you know, in an unusual position so you could see it, um, I did struggle a bit with it. And uh, the biggest thing was, if I had this to do again, um, I'd make this portion uh, right here of the uh, uh, handling structure much more rigid and robust because as I was handling it by this area, this area right here and on the other side 
was deflecting big time. And I was scared to death that I was going to break it and drop it, which would have been a disaster. So consequently, um, I got it off the dripping hook um, very early and, and got it sitting on these little uh, drying legs I incorporated into the gating um, because I was just, I was really starting to sweat it about, uh, you know, breaking it. But if I did that, um, it would have been, um, I could have added a couple other features because getting it off the, uh, the dripping fixture early meant that there was more excess uh, um, slurry still on the pattern. And even though um, it was, you know, uh, safer to set it horizontal sooner, that caused some of the slurry to puddle down in, in these little corners right here um, by the bosses and to a lesser extent um, up, in, up in here, although I'd say 90% of it ran out of these uh, areas up here when it was hanging. But these were kind of natural collection areas and, and the, uh, the slurry maybe puddled about a, a quarter of an inch deep or so in there. And, and if I let that set, um, it would have taken a really, really long time to dry down in those cavities. And, uh, you know, obviously it, it wouldn't be very permeable at those thicknesses. So um, what I did was, is I just, after it was sitting there, I took a brush and just kind of wicked it out of there and uh, got rid of the excess on here and the same locations on, on the other side. And uh, it's fine because it was enough that it self-leveled. Um, afterwards and you know the coating thickness looks you know nice and uniform um, like it usually does on these but um, the only places that are still um, really wet are you can see where you probably can't see and I don't know that I can show you very well but these pockets down in here are still kind of dark green and you can tell they're wet they'd be they'd be wet to the touch and also um, on the bottom side you can see the, uh, the color difference there on the bottom side, namely here and up in these pockets. So, and that's because, you know, when it's sitting down like this, there's only about a one inch gap at the bottom and uh, the, the water vapor that's evaporating off the slurry makes that area very moist. So it's just not going to dry, but I probably have um, a good week uh, before um, I'm going to be ready to pour this thing. Um, it's been, I have to build a lot of other apparatus uh, to get my pour size um, up on that. But, uh, so I'm not going to worry about it because in a day or two, it'll be, everything will be bone dry no matter what position um, it's in. So that's not a worry. So I'll just let it uh, naturally dry. But um, if I wanted it to dry faster, I'd probably hang it or just set it on end like this and, and leave those sides exposed. And, Surprisingly, um, you know, the, uh, the runners, the interior of the runners, they actually, for the most part, look dry. And I thought that I might have to even set up, uh, you know, something forced air uh, to get those runners uh, uh, dried out. But it looks like they're going to dry out just fine. So there won't be any issues um, with that. So really, the only thing that's um, left is uh, <clears throat> I'll attach a longer sprue. Here, I'll just glue it on right before I pour and uh, obviously I don't put those on be, um, when I'm coating it because it makes the pattern so awkward to handle and it's just another fragile piece that, that uh, makes it difficult to handle and manipulate when it's wet and heavy on that. But that's quick enough. I mean I just uh, take hot glue and just stick the, the sprue onto it right before I'm ready to pour and coat the sprue separately on that. But maybe you know just for the coating purposes I can give you a little close up there of the wax appliques. You can see there you go the part numbers and the and the applique there. Um, they turned out nice. They should print through you know, nicely. I mean, hopefully they will. And hopefully we'll be talking about a successful uh, pour. Be sure to tune in to that intake manifold um, video if uh, you may already be watching it because I plan on using this just in a little part of that segment in addition to this coding video as well. But uh, it's more or less ready to pour now. I just got to get my game together um, on uh, the pouring apparatus to handle my A60 crucible um, with 40, 45 pounds of aluminum in it. But uh, be sure to tune into that video. I think I'm going to wrap it up here um, for the coating video because um, I detest long videos. They get more than a half an hour. I lose interest in that. And for the intake manifold video, 
I think I'm going to wrap it up here as well, uh, at least for part one, that gets to the point where the pattern's ready to pour, and I'll break out the rest of uh, that in this video for the intake manifold into a second part for the actual pour, and hopefully, uh, hopefully a successful result. But um, thanks for watching. Sorry, the audio um, is so-so uh, on my videos. I bought a uh, I bought a remote wireless mic that doesn't work, <laughs> so I need to buy return it and buy another one on that. But uh, um, I'll try to get my video and audio game up a little bit in the future. But thanks for watching. I'll be back with you shortly on the intake manifold video, and that's it for the uh, coding uh, video. Take care.